Continuation of Chapter 11 False Definition of Human Dignity Unfortunately, a good part of public opinion is now imbued with false ideas concerning social doctrine. The Pope, then, in his third point, denounces a false definition of human dignity and one is forced to conclude that he was not well heeded because this definition corresponds exactly to the notion of human dignity that can be discerned in the texts of Vatican II. It is the same thing. Quote, According to the Sion, man will be a man truly worthy of the name only when he has acquired a strong, enlightened, and independent consciousness, there's the conscience, able to do without a master, and there's human dignity, obeying only himself, and able to assume the most demanding responsibilities without faltering. Such are the big words by which human pride is exalted. End quote. A consciousness, strong, enlightened, and independent, able to do without a master, obeying only self. This is exactly the meaning adopted by the Council. Quote, now men are becoming increasingly conscious of their dignity. Man has become an adult. End quote. These words are, moreover, the very title of the Declaration on Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, the famous human dignity. Quote, Contemporary man is becoming increasingly conscious of the dignity of the human person. End quote. As if all who have gone before us lacked the consciousness of human dignity, of the true human dignity, which is to be sons of God, to submit to him, to obey his law, and to be attached to the truth and charity. The second phrase of this declaration is equally significant. Quote, more and more people are demanding that men should exercise fully their own judgment and a responsible freedom in their actions. End quote. Here it is exactly. Strong, enlightened, and independent, obeying only himself. It is incredible that the like should be found in an official document. Man must act by the light of his conscience, and no one must apply any pressure. We are indeed forced to observe that those who are in error, the modernists and the progressives, are, alas, ever more numerous. In the same text, coercion is often mentioned. There must be no coercion. And it is not, of course, a matter of physical coercion, but moral coercion, the coercion of the magisterium. Every kind of coercion must be suppressed. That is to say that everyone must be autonomous and must not depend upon a superior. No authority. It is incredible. Quote, Men should not be subject to the pressure of coercion, but be inspired by a sense of duty. End quote. Everyone will determine his duty and form his own conscience. This is exactly the expression of false human dignity, by which man would only be man by obeying his own independent conscience, free of the objective authority of truth. St. Pius X made very clear to what such a conception of human dignity can lead. Quote, such are the big words by which human pride is exalted, like the dream carrying man away without light, 
without guidance and without help, into the realm of illusion, in which he will be destroyed by his errors and passions, whilst awaiting the glorious day of his full consciousness. End quote. By repeating, quote, no constraint, all teaching comes to be rejected. The truth must not be taught. Everyone must find his own truth. The text of Dignitatis Humanae unbelievably develops the point. Quote, it is in accordance with their dignity that all men, because they are persons, that is, being endowed with reason and free will, and therefore bearing personal responsibility, are both impelled by their nature and bound by a moral obligation to seek the truth. End quote. Thus, no one would be held to obey the truth he is taught, that is, the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, who imposed himself upon us as our master when he said, quote, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. End quote. Mark 16.16 16. Our Lord did indeed present himself as master. He did not simply say to men, Seek the truth, and let every man follow his conscience. Our Lord was clear, Behold the truth, and you must obey it. They have the audacity now to pretend that their theory, by which everyone is free to follow his conscience, was taught by sacred scripture, and that it was our Lord who taught it. A few days ago, I met Cardinal Odi, and I told him, it is a blasphemy. To affirm such an anti-truth is blasphemous. This is indeed what St. Pius X said about the erroneous conceptions of the Sion. The Sion transformed the gospel too, and by so doing it blasphemed. To assert that our Lord told everyone to follow his conscience is to do like the Sion. It is odious to dare commit such an offense. Nonetheless, it continues. The conciliar declaration goes on. Quote, Men help one another in the search for truth. Moreover, it is by personal assent that men must adhere to the truth they have discovered. End quote. But it really is a duty that is imposed upon us by our masters, our priests, by the authority, by those who know the truth and who teach it to us. We need to be taught. If everyone must seek his truth, one can no longer teach the catechism to children. For according to this argument, it would be to constrain them. It would be constraining the children to teach them something and to oblige them to follow the truth. Rather, they must seek it themselves and adhere to it according to their own conscience and by the act of their own will. And they tell us, quote, You have no right to impose any constraint. It is unthinkable as well as unbelievable. Quote, but men cannot satisfy this obligation in a way that is in keeping with their own nature, as if all constraint frustrated nature, as if the good God had wanted there to be no constraint, quote, unless they enjoy both psychological freedom and immunity from external coercion, end quote. It is clear that physical coercion is not in question, even though St. Augustine himself wrote, quote, Yes, at the beginning, I also believed that one could not constrain men to believe in the truth. But now that I have seen and observed that thanks to the orders given by the emperor to pursue the error of the Donatists, thanks to the force that was used to impede their meetings and close their temples, to threaten them with exile and the loss of their goods, 
the Catholics who had fallen into the error had a chance to reflect and have now returned to the truth and say, Blessed coercion that helped us to recover the truth. Now we recognize that we were in error, but now we have found the true path thanks to the emperor, who sent soldiers to combat error. Now I understand that force can very well be used to reduce the enemies of the faith and prevent the diffusion of error, and indirectly cause men to return to the truth. End quote. Footnote. See St. Augustine, letter 93. St. Thomas explains that one can legitimately exercise coercion on those who apostatized from the Catholic faith, quote, in order to oblige them to perform what they promised, end quote, by receiving baptism, that is, to keep the faith. See Summa Theologica, Secunda Secunde, question 10. End footnote. It is St. Augustine himself who said this. Of course, it is only a question of using constraint in certain cases. But what is and remains a duty is to pursue error and vice, to prevent error from spreading, and to drive it out. For Catholics, for all those who believe and have the faith, a duty exists to defend the faith against the error that seeks to destroy it. Quote, immunity from external coercion, says the Council. It speaks not of physical constraint, but of moral constraint. Now, when our Lord said, quote, If you refuse belief, you will be condemned. Wasn't that psychological constraint? The threatened condemnation is hell. Is it not a rather rude constraint to say either this or hell? It is indeed a moral constraint that causes the one to whom it is addressed to tremble. It is the fire of hell for all eternity if you do not believe. Would our Lord then not have the right to do it? According to the principles of the Declaration on Religious Liberty, one is free to follow his conscience, no constraint. Hence, parents do not have the right to discipline their children. Consequently, they do not have the right to baptize their children. Perhaps he would not wish to be baptized, and so on. From the false notion of human dignity spring forth evidently unbelievable consequences. St. Pius X thus concludes his reflections on the errors of the Sion. Quote, Unless human nature can be changed, which is not within the power of the Sionists, will that day ever come? Did the saints who brought human dignity to its highest point possess that kind of dignity? And what of the lowly of this earth who are unable to raise so high, but are content to plough their furrow modestly at the level where providence placed them, they who are diligently discharging their duties with Christian humility, obedience, and patience, are they not also worthy of being called men? We close here our observations on the errors of the Sion. End quote. 